Welcome to the Select Board Board of Health and Sewer Commissioners meeting of November 1st, 2023 at 6 p.m. Um, this meeting will be held in a hybrid fashion with opportunity for both in-person attendance and remote participation. Please note that while an option for remote attendance and or participation is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technological problems interrupt the virtual broadcast unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public with particular interest in any specific item on this agenda should make plans for in-person versus virtual attendance accordingly. The meeting will be held in person in the main meeting room of the Deerfield Municipal Offices in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 30A. Anyone intending to record this meeting must identify themselves to our clerk, Trevor, and provide their name and address for the re record. Thank you very much. And we'll um, start with uh, calling the meeting to order and then turning it over to the planning board so that they may call their meeting to order. Go ahead, Denise. It looks like you might have a quorum. You have three people at least. I'm, Emily's on her way. Oh, okay. Do you want to yeah, wait? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, she said she'll be here. <laughs> oh, here she comes. Just like here that. she comes. All right. Hey, thanks, Emily. Okay, I'll call the planning board meeting to order. Um, take roll call. Kathy Sylvester. Here. Rachel Blaine. Here. Emily Gaylord. Here. Denise Mason. Here. Okay. Um, we have uh, a wonderful um, person, uh, Erica Higgins Ross, has uh, put her name in for a candidate to uh, for the vacant seat from Anna Lee, and um, we'd like you to weigh in on that. So the, the planning board. Well, yes. Um, I would love to have her on the board. <laughs> I think she'd be a great addition. I don't know what others, you know, what others think. I mean, I don't know her very well. I've spoken with her a couple of times. You know, I I saw her email. Um, I know she's a very smart and motivated woman. Um, I know that uh, we've been having this vacancy for a while, and um, we've had no interest. And so I'm thrilled that somebody has stepped forward mm -hmm. that is um, seemingly committed. So um, we'll accept a motion. From the select board? From the select board and then okay. we'll- um, I'll make a motion that we appoint um, the, uh, we appoint Erica Higgins Ross to the, um, to the term remaining. Uh, I'm not sure what the- Until term, the next election. Until the yeah. next election, I think, right? Yeah. Right. It's okay, just so it's a May. vacant seat till the next election right. um, for the planning board. And I'm just so happy that she's willing to serve. She's a wonderful person, very dedicated to the town, and, and I think she'll do a great job. And I'll second all of those comments. Um, and then, Denise, you, I, I believe you have to do the same thing for the planning board, and then we just vote. All of okay. us go out and vote. All right. Well, I'll make a motion to appoint Erica to the planning board until the next election. I second it, Kathy Sylvester. Okay. So then we'll have a, a roll call vote. And I believe we all, um, our votes all are weighed the same. So um, Tim? Uh, Tim Ilchi, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. And then Denise, you just go um, around your planning board. Okay, Kathy Sylvester. No, Kathy Sylvester, aye. Emily Gaylord. Emily Gaylord, aye. Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, aye. And Denise Mason, aye. Um, perfect. It's unanimous. That's so uh, there's no discussion, further discussion, and nope. or no debate about our um, votes. So. Erica, thank you. thank you, Erica. And you just have to come in um, to the town hall to get sworn in and uh, then you're eligible to vote on the meetings Monday, your Monday planning board meeting. And while you guys are all here, I just wanted to say first, thank you for your service. And also um, 
the the Leary lot proposal will be coming up, and I wondered if you, Denise, might reach out to the Conservation Commission and maybe Casey to try and maybe coordinate so that we can have meetings to move it forward at the same pace rather than having them separate and uh, just a thought. We have met with um, the Conservation Commission at, uh, simultaneously before, uh, you know, right. had the same meeting. Yep. Okay. That'd be great. So, to, Tim, are you are you asking for them to join the meeting on Monday? I'm asking you to coordinate with them, and whether you have to have a special meeting before the end of November or, you okay. know, early in December, whatever is convenient for you sure. to. Uh, I just don't see the point of having two separate things happening. I agree about the okay. same topic. Um, so, so whatever you guys think is best. I was just. Um, if you're going to bring it up on Monday, maybe they would be willing to sit in on Monday because there's plenty of time uh, okay. for Monday posting, right? Sounds, so, sounds good. You know what? I'm not going to keep planning board members any longer because I know they all have things to do. So I will get in touch with Pete Law and I'll coordinate with Casey and Amy. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. Denise, you just have to adjourn your meeting. Um, do I have to? We adjourn. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have a great night. Thanks, Thanks for everyone. Hey, and, um, congratulations to Erica. I think she's yes. going to be great. Yeah. She's going to be a great yeah. night to see your board. I'm really I'm excited. Yeah. I'm thrilled we Excellent. have Excellent. Thanks, and everyone. Through. And I'll see the rest of the planning board members Monday at six o'clock, and I will send a reminder because it is a different time this time. We yeah. apologize. Denise, Denise you just might want to make sure that Erica gets sworn in before the meeting on Monday. I will. Okay. I will. Okay. All right. On the list. Thank you. Thank you all. Great. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Um, I'm, st I'm um, staying. I'm so and then Denise, uh, you uh, have a little update for, on the CCI oh, the Connecting sure. Community Initiative for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll do an update. And actually, you know, thanks for asking, Carolyn. And I would be happy to come periodically and give an update. So I'll just, there's, there's so much to update, so I, I won't talk about everything, but I just, I do want to say that CCI coming up to, I think November 16th is going to be our two year mark of CCI. And I'll tell you, I think it's been a really great experience for everyone on CCI because we're actually, we're all talking to each other. We're getting things done. Um, we're not duplicating efforts. And I think that that's great as far as, you know, time management and also as far as financially, I think it's so much better. So I'll, I'll, I'll do a quick thing. You know, when we started out, this actually came from senior housing, which was a brilliant idea. And I think Lily was the one that was talking about it. So we, you know, we came up and we, we, we met and we came up with all the different initiatives. And, you know, as I was looking at the initiatives that we began with two years ago, we're staying pretty true to what we talked about, what we wanted to do. Um, a centralized municipal campus, housing for older adults. Um, I think everyone knows that senior housing is really moving forward um, as to where senior housing is actually going to be on the campus that still has not been determined. And, you know, while I'm there, I do want to mention that a lot, you know, a number of people are posting on Deerfield now, and unfortunately, it's a lot of misinformation. So, um, you know, so I welcome anybody to join CCI. We do have public comment, two minute public comment. So please do that or get in touch with me personally. I'm happy to answer anybody's questions at any time. Um, in the meantime, we've been working, um, all of us have been working really hard on this, everyone in CCI. We're working on the 1821, which is the former church that was donated, and Tim's put in a lot of work on that. I mean, we were calling out old cushions. I know in the meantime, it's going to be used to house the library, which I think is a real win, win-win situation, because the library, you know, doesn't have to find another place to do business. It's right next door to the current library, and they don't have to pay. So, I mean, that saves the town money. Um, I think the library is going great. Julie, Tim, and I are on um, the library building committee, and I I'm really impressed with the architect and the OPM. Um, as far as the 1888 building, you know, once again, you know, Tim, <laughs> Tim wrote to, uh, I think, Markey and Senator Warren, and we are hopeful, keeping our fingers crossed, that we could potentially get a $4 million earmark for that space. 
So that's moving forward. Um, the town common, you know, everybody's worked tirelessly on that. Unfortunately, it's at an impasse because of Department of Transportation because they own the road. So I just want to let everyone know that everyone is working really, really hard. I think we're all really excited about what's happening. And, you know, if you have questions, just ask us. Come to a meeting, come to a planning board meeting, select board meeting, CCI, and or senior housing. Um, again, I think the Leary lot, that's pretty exciting. That's moving along. I think the Energy Committee has done a great job with that. So, you know, once again, we're all working together. And um, if anyone has any questions, just ask. So, thank you. Thank you're you, welcome. Denise. Um, any questions, let me know. Does anyone ha have any questions of Denise? No. Thank you. All right. Um, Denise, I just want to say that I did meet today with. Um, uh, Kimberly at the FERCOG and Taz, um, Tasman at the FERCOG on the watershed plan for Bloody Brook that, of course, is a significant impact on our campus plan. And so they seem to be moving forward on that. Uh, they, the money runs out in June. So they're, they've, after two years, they're moving forward on that. So I'm, I'm pretty excited. So that once we get the watershed plan, that will allow us to work with the conservation district grants that I have for um, removing invasives along Bloody Brook, planting a buffer, pollinator buffer, uh, native buffer that will hopefully suck up and filtrate water and then release water and droughts. Um, but then also um, have field geology um, come down and assess the health of the Bloody Brook so that we can figure out how to manage it as a, you know, a healthier river. So um, I'm pretty excited about those because those that, those grants were kind of waiting for the watershed recommendations um, that will hopefully free up 319 DEP 319 money. So um, that's exciting. Um, and we are, the ANRAD, unfortunately, the wetlands delineations plan is moving forward, but it was continued because the wet, but the wetlands expert has come out and, and apparently done the work um, this week, this past week. So hopefully we'll be able to do the conservation commission meeting. Hey, Carolyn, are you talking about the additional borings that they wanted to have? Yes. we. I think okay. it was on Friday, last Friday. Okay. So That's I'm pretty great. excited about that. So uh, there is a lot of movement actually on yeah. the, all of a sudden on the campus. So hey, oh, Carolyn, I'm sorry. One more thing. Um, there's an, there's another grant and Tim's been doing the lion's share of work on that along with um UMass and I think FERCOG, I'm not exactly sure where everything is, but it's a heat grant to, yes. to um, a feasibility study for a geothermal system to connect the five municipal buildings. So, you know, we're continuing to work on that. There's so many different moving parts, but um, yeah, we're just moving ahead. Uh, that's fantastic. Okay. Right. Uh, thank you, Denise. Uh, you're welcome to stay, but I probably um, figure you have other activities. <laughs> yeah, a few. <laughs> okay, thanks. See you. Uh, good night. Night. Uh, next item on the agenda is select board reports. Um, the rural school aid bill update. Um, actually, it was a failure to testify on my part. Um, I waited all four hours of the public hearing, and I was the last one called. And they kept calling my name and I was clicking that button and I couldn't get on. It don't work that well. Uh, I could not figure out any Thank button you. that would make it work. But I will, uh, well, I'm going to submit yep. um, a written testimony of what I was going to say. Obviously, it doesn't go into a lot of detail because it was only uh, supposed to be two minutes. But it basically says that at no fault for the schools, just contractual increases. Um, we, the schools are always going to be more than 3%. And um, our, our poor superintendent who is really, of all the superintendents I've worked with over the years, um, is the, one of the best. Um, he has no ability with such a personnel heavy budget to do much. And, and that's also our problem as a municipality because ours 
is personnel heavy. And so we're getting squeezed because we're having to pay more for retention of qualified people. So um, it's really a conundrum. It's awful, makes for awful budget process. And, you know, everybody's at a, a really a shrinking pie fighting over the, the dollars. So I'm hoping that um, it seemed like everyone was on the same page, very direct that we just, they're, you know, the rural schools are falling behind. They're not, our kids don't have the same opportunity as suburban and urban um, schools. That it is, you know, that the Student Opportunity Act, which was supposed to give more money is ridiculous for us because we have declining enrollment. So 60 bucks, even if they double the 30 bucks to 60, it doesn't even, I mean, it's not even one kid's cost of regular ed. So anyway, the bottom line is everybody hopefully is rallying to support these bills. It will mean predictable, adequate funding for our schools and will make the budget process so much less stressful for us. So I think it's really critical. We're trying to get all the towns to sign on and and our group is very good. Mm -hmm. So that's about it. Anything, um, you all have anything for sure. select board? Um, I just wanted to thank all the residents for um, a really great Halloween last night. The kids yes. just had a really good time. Luckily it was decent weather, a little chilly, but um, the creativity of the, of the residents and um, making the, the night really special for the kids was just was really great. Um, I think the Hayride will be on Sunday. They um, had to cancel last Sunday from the rain and uh, every weekend it rains, it seems like. But um, but they, it, they felt it was unsafe to do it, you know, when all the kids are in the street that, uh, and the farmers Sunday worked best for them. So I think they're planning for this Sunday, uh, people want to take advantage of that. It's always a good time. Um, uh, there was some sad news that we um, that Louise Law uh, passed away last week. And for those who know her, she was um, with the our Union um, School District for over twenty five years. She was our, our elementary um, curriculum coordinator and had done just an amazing job of moving our schools forward and um, being, you know, setting our schools up to be a leader uh, for educating our kids. Curriculum is such an important part of education and what you select for um, the curriculum that will be taught and, and giving the teachers uh, professional development and focusing on different ways to teach over, you know, a quarter of a century in our schools is um, she just had an amazing impact on on our elementary school. When I was president of PTO, she was she got hired and she was excellent. Yeah, it made a huge difference. I re I remember from the before to after in just a couple of years. It was yeah. amazing. Just her dedication yeah. and such a kind person and uh, just a big loss uh, for for the region. So I uh, just wanted to say my heart goes out to her family and um, and all the people that she worked with. Um, I had a steward meeting today, um, for our monthly meeting number 29 was today, um, and not a lot to report. Everything seems to be moving along pretty good. They uh, were, they had last month, they reformed up the clarifier walls on the existing clarifier. They've been working on pouring the walls for the um, North aeration tank. Um, so a lot of that stuff is, is in the works. Um, they will probably wrap up by the, January or so and be gone for about eight weeks and then we'll come back in the spring and, and finish off everything um you know regrade and seed everything and a lot of the stuff will be cleaned up before that um but I think we're in pretty good shape we had the change order stuff we approved a while back we still held off on some of that like the drainage we're just making I mean, it's getting close on the money so we're just waiting to make sure before that large um, the largest part of the change order we would give approval for. They don't need that approval until around February. So we're going to kind of wait on that. We're doing the other smaller things that we know we can afford and just kind of waiting. Um, I think we're going to get some credit back on a couple of sensors we're not using. So that'll kind of add to that. So we're just trying to be careful and not do anything too soon. Uh, so we should have some information by you know, February, we might go, go forward with that stuff in the fall, in the spring. So, um, but everything else is on target. The grit uh, motor has 
still been an issue and that got pulled from the headworks. Um, it went up uh, to a facility in Greenfield, then it went to another facility and then it went back to Greenfield. Now it's at another facility. They're like, you know, but they're all been in touch with us, but between the supplier, they're trying to figure out what's going on with the motor. And so they may end up having to replace it or we'll do a different one, but they're going through all that checks and we've held money back on that. But we, um, that's really the only thing that hasn't worked in the whole plant. So we're, um, and they don't understand why it'll come on and run for a minute and then shut off. I'm not really sure if it's a relay or something inside the motor that's bad. So, so they're still working on that. We should have an answer this month on it. Um, and is that, is that a three strikes and you're out? <laughs> the third time they just put in a new whole yes. assembly. Hopefully, exactly. hopefully, yeah. yeah. Once, once hopefully. they once they get some answers, once they I think the the supplier really is trying to get an answer on what's happening with the thing and. Um, uh, and it has to be a facility that can work on explosion, explosion proof motors. So it's not everybody that can right. do that. So I think they're finally nailing that stuff down, but yeah, eventually we have enough money held that we can just go buy a different motor. So, um, and we'll, we'll plan on that next month if, if needed. Um, the gate went in, looks really good. The fencing is up. Um, some of the paving's done. Um, just finishing up uh, punch list stuff and, you know, all these little things that need to get addressed, but a lot has been done. So it's really, it's winding down and looking pretty good. Good. Uh, I think that's all I have at the moment. Tim, did you have some stuff so, to uh, talk about? Just a few things. I'll follow up on um, something Denise mentioned. There's the home energy efficiency team application that we're looking at. Um, I've been trying for about a month to get somebody from heat.org to talk to me about what, um, you know, what sort of a, what they're looking for in the application. The application, pre-application deadline was today, and we have a partial, partial thing pulled together, but it's possible that uh, I'm trying to arrange a, a meeting with um, Lauren Madison from the Clean of UMass Clean Energy Extension Service and a representative heat for either tomorrow or the next day to discuss it. It may be that um, you know Lauren's hopeful that uh, she thinks our project is is worthy of the the application process, but it's a matter of time and energy and and whether we have the resources to pull in a good application together. But so that's one thing. Um, Church engineering is going to be talked about by Casey later, the 1821 uh, structural defect that we need to work on. Um, the um, peer review for the proposals, the competing proposals about how to design the old Deerfield wastewater treatment facility, some issues need to be addressed so that the, the peer reviewer can, you know, work with. Do we want to talk about that now or? Uh, I've got some information for you too, if you want. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I had a conversation with Dave, and I think he oh, got good. to you too. Yep. That great. They're going to um, they're going to do an um, operation and maintenance projection for either annual or yearly um, uh, to operate the old Deerfield waste wastewater treatment facility. Um, I so that they, you know, the peer reviewer can compare the. The annual costs for each yeah. of the systems. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not sure how the DA proposal played out either um, in that regard. Uh, and then apparently, um, NewPro want, wants to donate either the whole or some components of a solar array, and we need to work about that. I talked to Eric about that, and he said he might be able to find a place for it there. He's like, why don't we put it on the roof of this building, on the sludge building, or what? Do, you know, so yeah. I think he's open to putting it there. So I, I wasn't sure if he would have a spot for it. He said, we'll make a spot, or if it can save yeah. money on electricity. The, the thing is, oh, I, I think from the standpoint, yeah, I mean, the, I don't know. the solar tracker, apparently it has a... a it has an inverter, which is what converts the solar direct current electricity into alternating current electricity. So it can, yep. you know, work with the grid. It's no longer legally usable. Okay. So that would need to be replaced. Um, the panels themselves could be put anywhere. Uh, you would have to just 
do the wiring and, yeah. and, and the, an electrical panel that brings in direct current, converts it to AC, and then ties it into the system. So at a minimum, when we talk about it, um, we need to authorize the town to accept some or all of the system. New Pro has cleaned out all the asbestos in the building that they own, which this tracker, solar tracker is associated with, mm -hmm. and they want to demolish it as soon as possible. So we need to get back to um, their their general counsel with a, with a plan and acceptance, either a part or all of the thing. I mean, it'd be nice if we could have a solar tracker because it it's much more efficient. Yeah, but there would be cost associated with installing it, and right. You know, I don't know that we could cover that with any of the money that's left over in the in the budget down there. Um, but I have to no. say, if we can if we can cut the energy costs of of the sewer treatment plant, that's a win. Yeah. Oh yeah. For I mean, yeah. so can he was we open just? To it. So yeah. I think uh, is there? I don't know. Does Kevin still store salt up at the transfer station? Does I that, think that's you know, empty. Shed, I was thinking maybe we could store. I don't it think so. I don't think so. Figure out it's... what to do because that's not a legal storage stuff oh. spot anymore. I don't think they may. Store you mean sto things. legal storage for salt? Salt for yes. salt. Yeah, it, it looks empty to me, but yeah, um, the only concern is that the base is really heavy. Yeah. So you know, you we 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 need to make it. a decision and 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 figure out a me a method for getting the DPW or somebody else to remove this from the land. Yeah. Um, can can we agree that there's a consensus that we want it? Um, if and then usable, then but we we then, the budget then to can, fix it. Then can Casey follow up with Kevin to see, figure out how do we make this work? Yeah. So I think you have to vote to accept a gift right. of that particular piece of equipment, and then we can coordinate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have no problem with. I think it would be great if we could save the tracker system. Yeah, I do. Too. Um, and so there is acceptance of a gift of personal property for review and approval okay. on the agenda. Yeah, I so, see that here. So um, let's just go down what, to say, there. Do, do it later. We can yeah do it later <laughs> yeah well valerie's here so let's um put a pause on that pause, on that. put a okay. pause okay. on that discussion because i i i don't i mean i don't want new pro to not give it to us because we're not timely yeah I'm, um it seems like if, if there's room in that shed we could store it yeah over, or, over the winter we could make a plan, plan for it put it yeah. yeah but i mean with electrical and budget costs going up you know with january 1st we mm -hmm. we have to go up again right um i mean our our the municipal municipal rate is yeah. gonna bump up so um i really feel like this is a huge win for us if we can keep this um sewer treatment plant costs down okay so um board of health comments and announcements and updates um valerie's on here tonight um we had tobacco um violations and um unfortunately yeah and unfortunately uh i i thought we had updated our but come to find out we did not update our schedule fine schedule or regulations so valerie do you just want to talk about it a little bit about your research that you came up with Sure. Let's talk about the violations first. <clears throat> so you have three violations. Yep. Um, they, the facilities or the, the stores sold uh, tobacco products to a minor and yep. your fine is a hundred dollars. Yeah. Uh, when I researched it, your regulations haven't been updated since 2017. Right. Now, when, when did you join that alliance, the tobacco Alliance in Northampton. When when we got the PE, uh, you know, the Public Health Excellent Grant from the state last year, that was okay. one of the requirements is that we join the coalition. So we okay. joined the coalition. Uh, Did we sign something to join that coalition? Yeah, we signed. We voted to and signed to join. Okay, uh, but I thought at the time that we updated our regulations. But as mm -hmm. Trevor and I were just sort of remembering we there was discussion on our part that we thought the fine schedule was a little rough you know on our businesses um okay for like the first time you know if it's the first time in two or three years i don't i right. i'm i 
am want to be a little bit more lenient. But if it's the second violation within a 12 month period, guess what? I'm fine with the violate with the higher um, fines after that because clearly they're not fixing their mm -hmm. situation. So okay, so if you adopt you would you would adopt the state regulations and I talked to Casey about the process for that. The fines can't be changed. Right. The I know. Suspension yeah. period can be. You, you you can you can deviate from what the state says regarding the suspension period. So according to the news now th this wouldn't pertain to the violators now. This would be in the future, say January first or whatever. The first violation is a thousand dollars and three days suspension. And then the second violation is two thousand dollars and I believe a seven day suspension. And then the third violation is a five thousand dollars and thirty day suspension. Th those are the new regulations. So you want to review those and see if you want to adopt those. If you don't want to adopt that fee schedule, then you you're stuck with your old with your 2017 regulation or, or you can change that but you wouldn't can. be able to adopt the new state regulations right. because the fees cannot be changed i so I, think, I think we need to think about it some more okay i know i'm i'm i guess what was really bothering me is all three cumberland yeah. farms deerfield spirit shop and then neighbors didn't even ask for the id no and we and they hold and um, there's liquor licenses involved here. And if they're not, and we've had liquor license violations in the past, um, you know, where they're selling well, underage. So if if they're not- Two asked, but then they, they said they didn't have it. So they just sold it so anyway. anyway. I mean- Yeah, yeah. I, I, I did see that one of, them's, yeah. one of them asked for the ID and they didn't have it. And they yeah. sold it to him anyway. I did see that one. Yeah. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. One did. Yes, you're right. It just, it really, I have to say that really bothers me. I'm very disgusted that uh, this is happening. I, I will say that if you go with the state regulations and the first violation is $1,000 and they know it, they won't do it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I personally don't have any problem um, with if the state thinks that the violation structure is good, they're looking to promote public health. Um, cigarettes are definitely bad for your health. There's no question about it. So I personally don't have any sympathy for somebody who knows what the law is and they violate it. It's one thing if a youth comes in and has a fake ID and you don't know. It's entirely different. If you don't follow a process and and you sell tobacco to an underage person then you know there has to be a consequence um and i agree with you valerie that a thousand dollars is going to wake a lot of people up to not you know here's the policy anybody asks you for cigarettes can i see your id if you don't have an id i can't sell you cigarettes i uh, i go to big y to buy a bottle of wine i can't i'm obviously not 21 anymore or 20 or 18 or 17 and i still have to show my id and yeah. actually that's really true because i have to do yeah. the same thing and i'm clearly not no, 21 I, either yeah, so close. but they put it into the computer they put it into the computer so yeah. the fact that they're not doing that is is very and also that they sell liquor at the same establishments it just really bothers me so i i think well because we have the three violations, we're going to have a public hearing. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yes. So um, when we do that, I believe you also invite the uh, whoever was in charge of that, not the minor, but there's somebody that goes with the minor and they'll come to the meeting and they'll speak about the education about it and they'll have the, um, the evidence as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can I interrupt for a second? Sure. In our regulations, Valerie, there's no hearing requirement for a first offense. Okay. Just so did not. you, have you done that in the past? Have you had hearings in the past? Only after oh, only two alcohol. violations. Yeah. And only oh, okay. Alcohol. Okay. So what we would do is we would send a notification of a fine, but unless it, that's what I mean. If we send a notification of the fine, the first offense does not require a hearing but i think okay i my 
my recommendation is we send the fine and along with that fine that Deerfield is going to adopt, we're going to hold a hearing and we're adopting the state, state regulations, regulations, which will be a thousand dollar fine and a five thousand dollar fine as of January 1st. Right. And uh, so just that peeing it up. So every and we send it to everybody who sells. That was exactly what Valerie right. talked and about so yesterday. Yeah. Thing, tee it up and they they're fully aware and we have a hearing and they're fully aware of the yeah. consequences because this cannot continue. So no, yeah. that's that was one of the things that Valerie said to me. So I think that's a great but, way to do it. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I, I would like to, so when Pat does the permits, when she does the permit renewals, instead of mailing them out, yep. I'm going to each establishment, whether it's tobacco or restaurants right. or any type of food establishment, I'm going to that and I, to that facility and I'm going to do an inspection. Thank and you. if it's a place that sells tobacco, I, I can give them a copy of the new regulations I and mean, explain it to them. Yep. These regulations are kind of come into effect January 1st because they all have to have their permits by December yeah. 31st. That's right. Yep. So, so it we, goes right in the timeline. Yeah. Yep. Thank is you there, for doing is, that. is there a requirement for like two week notification to it? Yes, there is. So there is a we process. We have to post it. I mean, that's what happened. I think what what happened mm -hmm. last time we, we, were, we didn't have enough of a discussion and then we ended up not posting it. And, and it just dropped because we got too busy on other stuff. All right. Well, let's. So we looked the process up and I actually think I sent that out yep. uh, and blind carbon copied you all. So what we need to do is finalize that schedule. Um, what we had talked about, Valerie and I had talked about was doing a hearing in the middle of December. And we have plenty of time to get that noticed properly and posted. Um, yep. So what I would do in that letter that conveys the requirement to pay the fine of a hundred dollars would yeah. be to notify them that they need to review whatever is posted um, mm -hmm. for potential adoption but that we would consider using the state regulations which include a thousand dollar fine and right. suspensions etc yeah. i won't go into all the details though but yeah um definitely that the board of health is considering adopting new regulations and and if we could get a uh maybe just uh, a printout of the state regs. I don't think you those, have it. You have it. Here? Yep. I have the the update that I gave you this afternoon, Trevor, includes it. Oh. They just are printed in smaller print because oh, they actually in the back. That's right. Yeah. You gave another whole package. Yeah, I that's gave you right. another whole section. That's right. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Tim and Carolyn had it incorporated into their package. Yes. Okay. So okay. it should be in there, Tim. Okay. okay. So with those regulations, are the ones I sent you from that other town? I can yes. get those in, in word form. So you, you can change, you can make changes and take out the town of Essex That'd and put great. it in your field and make some changes as you wish. Okay. That would be great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Valerie. Is there anything else you want to discuss before we move on to school absenteeism trends? I saw you. We had clean out on Mountain Road. Thank you. That's thank you. Yes. Yep. 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 I believe I sent I sent you an update. So if yes. you haven't looked at your email, yep. no, nope. you, we got you it. it. Okay. Yep. All set. It, and I think that's it. All, All right. right. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, thank Valerie, you. very much. You're welcome. I, Have a good night. I, again, I just want to thank you very much for working Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. It's so nice to know that everything is handled. So I really appreciate it. It's also a, a break for me. It gets me away from my husband who retired. <laughs> well, we I, didn't, I didn't hear that. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Thank You're you. welcome. Bye-bye. Um, every uh, week, I just want to mention this because this is interesting data. Um, every week in, in my epidemiology uh, meeting that we set the dashboard, you know, it's Greenfield, Montague, Sunderland, and Deerfield. And... Um, uh, the absenteeism, the chronic absenteeism uh, level is still high, um, much higher than pre-COVID. And we are trying to analyze that a little bit. Um, some of it is that there's still COVID obviously circulating and kids have to stay out five days and all that kind of stuff. But it is also 
a mental health kind of thing. And, and I brought this up before um, the conservation, Franklin Conservation District has um, a little grant that's working with the um, checker spot farm to come up with, you know, how kids can deal with climate change and plantings and stuff like that. But we're, we're really trying to think creatively out of the box. How do we support our schools and support our kids? And I just wanted to bring up the mental health aspect of, of you know, that's still hanging over from COVID. And, um, you know, that there just is more absenteeism than there was pre-COVID. And we yeah. just, you know, it's hard for kids did, to catch up. Do these numbers include the elementary school or do they include Frontier? Or what there should be there's, two there's, tables. There's Deerfield and then there's Frontier. Oh, the got it. Here we go. Yep. So I just, you know, it's not, uh, it's just interesting facts. It's some data and it's data that we're looking at. And I just wanted you all to mm. have some ability to look at that because you know that's part of our yep little grant that we have okay um, and we have a professional that's helping us look at trends versus the state we're we're in line with the rest of the state in the sense that there is more absenteeism but i mean it's just one more thing that we're asking the schools to deal with and it it you know it's just tough so i just wanted to bring that up okay so moving on um, Holyoke Hummus has one day liquor license mm -hmm. uh, request. Um, I'll make a motion to approve contingent on them turning in their insurance. I think that we're waiting on insurance, right? No, nope. it's all, it's, it's, oh, been it's, there? Oh, yep. okay. it's already yeah. there. It's, it's in, the I did put a copy in your packets. It's, uh, it's attached to the application and the permit. Okay. So I'll make a, one second. Okay. Okay. So it should be all ready to be approved. It's um, a pop-up okay. dinner on November 11th from 5 to 9 p.m. Um, yes. Oh, here we go. Yep. So you make that motion? Yep, I'll make the motion. Um, I'll second it. Is there... I don't see it in my packet, oh, but I'm sure here, it's there. Here it is, right here. You can look at it. Um, do you have any, uh, is there any more discussion on it? No, just that they have, this was a note in here, but they have turned it in yeah. now. Okay, okay, great. Yep. I'm um. Okay. So if there's no more discussion, all those in favor? Tim Hill, GI. aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank you, Casey. You're welcome. Um, so then we're back to the acceptance of the gift of the tracker and the solar panels. Um, I think we just, we accept the gift and then um, talk with Kevin and see if the shed might be a spot. Unless he has another spot in mind. I know not the barn that they're trying to get things out of, but um, I I don't know. I just think if we could use it, and I know that it's going to cost money because you're going to need an inverter and all that other stuff, but we could budget that over the winter and maybe, you know, maybe it takes us a year to put it in, but we, or we find some other money to make it affordable. And I think in the long run, it'll save us money. Um, right. And, you know, talking to Eric, he thought we could find a spot down there to make it worthwhile. And uh, uh, I, I just, I think in, it's a win win. I think so. let's look at it. See yeah. If we can make it happen. Um, I agree, and I I just was going to suggest um, that we vote on this, and then we notify um, New Pros mm -hmm. General Counsel tomorrow that we want to take the whole thing, yes, and um, All parts. and that we'll we'll coordinate with them about the removal, yep. even if they have to remove it and set it near the DPW until they can move it. Right, they might want to remove the panels anyway, just so that they don't damage them because. Right. Um, they're attached to a really heavy thing. Yeah. Um, but the the energy committee, I want to thank them for their mm -hmm. impetus on this. Um, they did some research with Solar Store, which is the company that apparently installed the system, and they were looking at ten thousand or so of costs. Uh, so it's probably a little more than that. But yeah, uh, we can we can once we remove the thing, we can hire any any um, company that installs these things to work with us, so. Okay. Um, so, so I'll make a motion to accept the gift of a solar tracker um, from New Pro. I'll second that motion. Okay, if there's no further discussion, all those in favor? Tim Hilge, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Um, and thank you, New Pro, and yeah. thank you again, as Tim said, the Energy Committee and everybody else that's been trying to figure this yeah. out. 
I, I really do feel like it is a win-win. Um, next item on the agenda is the social justice indicators. Mm -hmm. Again, um, Tim had done some research on this. And, um, you know, in my mind, I think we're getting uh, penalized because it's income-based. And we already do the work of taking out the incomes associated with the um, nonprofits properties for old Deerfield so that we can, you know, hopefully get a waiver for educational funding. Right. So I think we should try to get a waiver for this because it's at income based. And so I think, you know, being over a hundred percent is really penalizing us a hundred percent of the state. Right. Yep. And, and Tim, do you, do you yeah, have any I'm, more, I mean, did you come up I, with anything I, more? No, the that? thing is it's the, 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 the state has a, a social a social justice indicator uh, website and you know um it has layers i don't know how to use the the interface very well so um you know i would like every maybe we um maybe we move forward to this once we get a our planner um in place because it seems like you know knowing the demographics of the community is part of being able to plan so maybe that would be a a way to to review all of this because the state puts things up and then it becomes real even if it's not real so right. um yeah so well, I, I i agree we should push back because we're not going to be successful getting any grants if mm -hmm. we're always penalized for this stuff right or eliminated and and you know there's never enough grant money and our stories are we're putting a lot of effort and they're really well written mm -hmm. and I, you know, it just bugs me. I have to say, I mean, it's so, we yeah. need to fight it. What, what should we do? Should we just try to develop a plan for, you know, finding someone who can review this? Um, well, I mean, I, Chris, I feel like this is a little project for you um, to kind of analyze what you think the factors are and what factors that we can, you know, ask for a waiver on, you know, similar to the educational formula. But we just have to make sure that this is another um, another request. We just got to make sure he can fit it into his work. Oh, schedule, yes. Right? No, but I think it, he would be interested. That's why I was suggesting planner, you yeah. know, because um, you have we a have pretty a, heavy schedule for the planning economic. We haven't overburdened him yet. He doesn't know what he's getting into. Well, that's <laughs> we need to be very careful that we don't overload this I new know. person. Yeah. Well, well I, I I think my he, question is, what's your timeline, Carol? Well, I want to I, I, as soon as possible, but I think this is something that Chris could chip away at, and the reason why I say this is because he's has the interest. You know, he's taking these classes. Um, you know, for, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you could bring these up as problems or, you know, do it as a project for your, one of your classes, you know, um, I don't know what the curriculum is when you, you know, to do this, do you have to have your own individual projects sometimes? But to me, this would be one of those uh, projects that would be, um, you know, you could get credit for somewhere. I just don't want to saddle him with this. No, I know, time. but you could look into it if he's interested. Let us know how you feel. Yeah. yeah well, or if, if I may, um, so I, I put together a couple of pages in the packet this week uh, regarding the state's environmental justice indicators yep. and how they fit in with Deerfield's demographics. And Deerfield has one census tract that has four uh, block groups. And yep. each of those, they have measured demographics. And I printed out uh, what each of those look like from an environmental justice perspective. Uh, as has been correctly described, three of them are above 100% of the state's median income. And the fourth one is uh, block group four, which is in the very far southern part of town. That one actually comes close. Um, it almost meets the environmental justice grounds on the basis of income. Um, so that is definitely something to note. Um, as for the getting a waiver, I'm not sure how that would work um, compared with something like we've done with DESI in the past for getting our school aid numbers changed. Well, well um, I, I, what I was thinking is you do some kind of protest and, and whether it's a waiver or, you know, have them reevaluate. I mean, we're, we're, getting, we're getting charged for that income, but this is, we get no taxes. So, 
it, it just where's the social justice on that? You know, we're, we're we pay to educate the kids, and we don't collect pop property tax. So you know, it's. We're, I mean, to me, we're getting penalized. We're getting penalized on both ends. So how you push back with that's how what we would investigate i said a waiver because you know that's what we asked for desi is to give us a waiver but i don't know how if we asked are asked to be reclassified if we section off the town if that would give us some extra credit we'd have to investigate and talk to some but if you could give us a little information so that when we go to boston in um, January, this was my timeline, is to get some background information so we could be informed and we would just literally plop down in front of the state agency and, you know, the state people and say, you need to help us. What do we do? You know, I mean, that's how we got the DESE waiver to begin with. Yeah. But we just went down and said, this is, you know, analyzed that with this how could we be the 14th highest income level in the state? You know, this is not true. And and so it, we got help. This one, I think, would probably, if you could get them to reevaluate the numbers in section um, or group, block group four, I mean, we're at 67.7, it says, of, of the median. So I'm, at what level do you become environmental justice? Is it like very close to that or is it? So it's a little bit tricky. Um, initially, I was under the impression it was 65, um, which would make the fourth block group very close. Um, but it might actually not be that straightforward because it's 65% of, I, I think it's a certain percentage of the population needs to be at 65%. It's not just the raw number 65. The way they do it doesn't really seem intuitive to me, but it would be something that would need a little bit more demographic research into the incomes of people that live in the fourth block group of Deerfield. Um, and yeah, I think it's definitely an interesting question. Um, and it, it's it's a tough call to make because optically, you don't want to make it seem that we're saying other communities deserve less, but we have needs too, and those need to be addressed. So yeah, and if we qualify under an EJ designation, we're not saying that other people don't need it, we're saying that we qualify. <laughs> right. And Greenfield has this very small part of it, but it's considered an environmental justice uh, community because it has a couple of sections in the southern part of its uh, boundaries that qualify. So it would be good. And and uh, yeah. So you have about a month and a half, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and if we, don't get it, if we don't well, get it, if we don't get it no this way. year, we right. get it next year. Right. And mm -hmm. the the bottom line is, it's not like the school thing. We, we want this to be permanent. And as they make the adjustments in median and stuff, we flow along with it. Hopefully we stay under it. Mm -hmm. um, and but we right. do have to challenge it at some point. Yeah. I, and they, they do readjust the communities based on demographics each year. Like I know every year there's a, a list of places that used to be environmental justice block groups that are no longer and vice versa places that no longer that used to formerly not be that now are um and i think changing demo changing demographics definitely play a role in that um and one reason why sunderland has the environmental justice designation and deerfield doesn't is because of the student population right um, yeah. and the student population largely doesn't bring in a lot of income because most of them are full-time students which makes sense right. Um, so so as demographics change in the area, we very well could see a shift happen, I think. Well, we need to incorporate the 18 year olds at the private schools into that. <laughs> well, maybe, but maybe. they're they're legal voters. <laughs> Some of them. <laughs> um, but the, the thing that the, the reason why I question this, Chris, and then why I'm interested is because Sharon Petrarch and I, when we had to qualify for housing um when we were doing one of the housing almost senior housing projects we had to qualify for income and we literally knocked on people's doors and took the income and people willingly gave us information on their incomes and we did actually qualify we were more than 50 percent income eligible it was like 53 percent or something sharon can probably remember but we literally locked on people's doors because 
a lot of the people that lived in apartments and the multi, they don't do the demographics, they don't count. So right. if we're so close to that, if we're like 67% and we can get that, we, I don't have a problem knocking on people's doors and saying, do you have, are you renting an apartment to a student or is, can we account for how many individuals incomes are here and make sure that we're get below Being that accurate. 60 five percent because i'm i'm pretty sure that we can and it's just not accurately reported and if that's the issue let's get on it kind of thing um but uh, you know it, it is it's one of those things if you're interested you'd like have a couple minutes just keep plugging at it but it it's to help us get some background so when we go to boston we can be art more articulate and not just say how do we how do we fight, you know, how do we fight this effectively kind of thing? Yeah, and it could be, I mean, obviously, the one that's closest is block four. And um, if there is, you know, some some way to explain to these people and send them a mail, oh, I don't know what the best way, personal approach is probably the best, but, um, you know, it, it, and I don't know if like, for instance, does Massachusetts tax social security I, I know that the federal government allows it to be taxed but i think my accountant said that they don't tax social security earnings so no we haven't if, if, started if, collecting yet if yeah if if that doesn't count still maybe it does count as income but it just doesn't get taxed um, a lot of different things could play into this but it it's a lot less daunting to target block four than it is to try to do the whole town um, so we start with the lowest hanging fruit and see if we can get it into the environmental justice spectrum and and then move on. The reason why I I'm, I'm want to be serious about this is because um, when you do the subsidized senior housing, there are different pots of money based on income of the community. And that's why Sharon and I did that, not literally knocking on doors, was to make sure that we were eligible for that if you were over 50% of your population in that neighborhood, then you could be eligible for different pots of money. And I think that's really critical too, because we, that, you know, we're right, we're doing the municipal campus, we're doing senior housing. So our neighborhood is down here in this area. So are we eligible? You know, there is some multifamily housing that may be not accurately reporting. And I want to make sure that, that we are picking that up. And if we, and if it's just a few households that can make the difference, it, what a tremendous gift to us because then we're all of a sudden we're eligible for stuff, you know, legitimate sure. eligible. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So if you just want to pot at it, then at least, we'll have uh, some ability to understand a little bit better. You can just brief us once in a while. Yeah, I can look a little bit more into what the process they use for determining demographics is because it, I find it a little bit confusing. I know that they rely on information from the the federal census that happens once a decade, but in that case, I'm not sure how they're making adjusted adjustments year by year. So that's probably where I'll start. Okay, thanks Great. Chris. Thank you. Sure. All right, that's all I wanted was just have somebody look at it. Special, um, special legislation, bond anticipation note, uh, cash flow. Okay, so Rep. Lay and Senator Cumberford and their staff worked very hard in the past week and a half, two weeks to vet the language of the request for special legislative act. Thank you. To Thank validate you. the election from 2022 and bar any changes, which we hope would not happen, we're in good shape because... This actually has to be filed through the, through the governor's office. And I spoke to staff from the governor's office a couple of times. I've worked with attorney Mead and they filed that request today. Great. And I wanted to take a moment to thank everybody thank that helped us you. reach this goal. Oh, Rep. Blay, yeah. Senator Comerford, They're Corinne, Elena, help. Governor Healy and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, their staff, Jesse and Pat, um, Rick Manley, our bond counsel, Lisa Mead, our town counsel, Chris, um, Cassie Sandrell, Brenda Hill, and Sarah, and our financial advisors, because we couldn't have gotten this far without a lot of help to pull all these things together. 
Um, and they've been amazing. And I know that you would support me in saying we're so appreciative of yeah, your help. Very much. Yeah. Can you can you just make sure you say thank you? Oh yes. Uh, yes, I will. I officially. I was working on the, the select board meeting today, but um, and I I got the email. Uh, I read the email about midway through the day, so I'll send an email out. But I really wanted to make sure that it's yep. it gets heard in the meeting. Thank you. Perfect. So this bond anticipation note is specific to one thing. It's specific yeah. to validation of the election for the borrowing uh, for, for the three million dollars. The three million we borrowed last year for the sewer. Right. Oh, okay. It right. had something to do with a notice. So I kept hearing three million, and I was so saying, it was an administrative defect. What did I do? What did I, do? <laughs> I don't remember three million. No, yeah. so it was last year. All right. It was it was uh, during the election right. in May of twenty two. So the bond anticipation note comes up for renewal in December on the 8th. So we need to have what, what we're trying to do is work toward, there's, there's a series of functions that has to happen before that is sent to you guys for approval. Um, and in order to get the, across that goalpost, we've got to do two things concurrently and we're working hard to make sure that happens. Yep. I don't have an update on current cash flow. I wasn't able to talk to Sarah today, but I can tell you in terms and sort of, because cash flow sort of goes with our 2025 tax bills. Um, I know that Karen was trying to work with the districts. I don't have an update on what's going on with our what we may be be behind on with Patriot. So yeah. I haven't been able to check in with her. So bear with me. But we're and we're keeping an eye on those those things to Heather, make sure we Heather can try to get there. On trying to get stuff to us as fast yes, as we could Heather in is. November. Sarah confirmed that too. Yep. So thank you very much, Trevor. Yep. So um just so that I fully understand. So if now that Assuming the, the legislature approves or has approved or will approve. So what will happen is if the legislature approves it, the governor will sign the bill and we'll get notified as soon as that happens. Then we can do the. And then we, we finish the, going through that for the, bonding for the paperwork. Bond. So does that allow us to. I'm just trying to the ultimate purpose of the ban was to allow short term borrowing. Yes, oh. because part of the what we're doing for the borrowing is the work for the South Deerfield Wastewater Treatment Facility um, project. Mm -hmm. And we've been using bond anticipation notes to pay for that. Right. But when we get, we have to have this approved so that we can continue that with the goal eventually to get to the end of that project and do a full bond. Right. So this is a stopgap measure. And this, is, this is part of the measure to get there. Will it in any way affect um, the current cash flow situation? It could because we're waiting. So we did, I will I will say in terms of cash flow, there's one other detail. We did put our request in for the grant reimbursement from USDA. Right. That's going to help us. That, that was uh, But without funds from taxation and sewer bills, it, our cash reserves are decreasing significantly right. quickly. Right. And so what we're trying to do is, is basically hit both the borrowing thing as well as making sure that we have the resources to continue to pay the bills. And then once the election is done, we could borrow. It helps us solve for the road the repairs five, that we're, we're actually right. paying through under an emergency allowance. Right. So all these things are really sort of, it's the perfect storm. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and just a drill down more on the, on the emergency spending. Um, is there any allowance of, since it's an emergency, are we relieved of the, like sometimes when you work with a contractor, they give you a 30, 30 day delinquency, 60 day delinquency, 90 day delinquency. Are we, are we um, protected in any way uh, from late fees and so forth? So what we've tried to do is pay those bills as soon as we can. Right. Um, I don't think it's been a problem because Kevin might, Kevin or Brenda might've said something to me, mm -hmm. but really I think we're trying to keep on top of it because okay. it makes us able to continue to do the work that we need to do. Some and of it putting, isn't done. And putting the brakes on unnecessary stuff yes. that we can wait on right now. No yeah. more, like we got emergency stuff, but we don't need to tackle another project unless it's I, absolutely Well, and, and I want to say an example of that is Hawks care. Road because yeah. we're getting complaints about Hawks Road yep. not being done, but you, you can get one-way on. traffic up there. That's right. Whereas Hoosick's Road is completely closed. Right. Still. And we, and that hasn't even been started. So um, nothing's been done at Little Meadow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so people need to understand 
And we're monitoring River Road instead of actually starting any. Yes. I mean, we're still. Kevin's been monitoring that almost on a daily basis. And we're still collecting information on that. Um, it did drop another quarter of an inch um, after the weekend right. rain, but it's looking like because the week before was dry, that the amount of rain we got didn't equate to the same drop on right. other times. So. We're still collecting data to find out what's actually happening. So when we talk to an engineer, we get a plan for an emergency response to that road. Otherwise, we're going to still march forward with trying to do a mass works project. But you have to realize that that's two years out, mm -hmm. even if we get the grant. So well, I mean, the the, uh, the authorization to borrow five million, if if the voters approve it, special election. It doesn't go away. So, I mean, right. if we get if we get through the winter and we get through next year, and then we haven't finished our mass mass works application, and something catastrophic happens, we Correct. still have that borrowing we authority. Yeah. Right. So, yep. or so we, we get reimbursed from the state, and then we don't right. have to worry about it. Right. Anyway, the idea is again that the borrowing gives us flexibility to move ahead as as conservatively and as effectively as possible without spending resources mm -hmm. that we because don't have Because regardless to. of how, whether we're spending in an emergency fashion or not, that has to be settled okay. before June 3rd or yes. by June 3rd I know. Right? And in order for us to close the and it And if we know we're getting some money from the state pretty soon, Kevin will try to, you know, work on Hawks Road. But yeah, we need to I have to say right. that you can get through Hawks Road, right. whereas other things are still not fixed. Yep. So, um, I mean, we still have nine to twelve million dollars hanging out there, and people just need to know that those are things that happen in the next three to five years under grants. Yeah. Um, so that we're not using town taxpayer money, but. To the best what of we're our talking blood. about is money that's already been spent, already been committed to mitigate those flooding events, to, to to open up the roads that are that were closed. So, anyway, so the lease, yes. So, so the South County EMS lease has you had already approved it, subject to um, change legal changes as necessary. Yes. Um, I received the last approval, which was from Waitley this this yesterday afternoon. Uh, so the Board of Oversight has recommended it. Uh, Sunderland's approved it and signed. Waitley's approved it and signed. Okay. So, so it's just uh, Deerfield needs to approve it and sign both so, from okay. a member of the SCEMS group as well as the landlord. So okay. I'll make a motion to approve the um, lease extension for South County EMS Medical Services. Uh, let's see. For for five year five year extension, I think it'll go to twenty twenty uh, June thirtieth, twenty twenty eight. Yes, yes. At the current rate. At the current rate. And I'll second it. Um, all those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn S, aye. Okay, that's unanimous. Casey, you want to talk about the tax bills? So really, so, what we're waiting for oh, is sorry, we've uh, got to get through that. Yeah, do we need to sign anything or? or... No, we sign here and here. It's, right, it's, I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. I it's have here. a separate copy ready. Right. That's guys. what I meant. Here, right. yeah. So the tax bills, we would hope to get them out as soon as we can set the tax rate. Um, I don't know what the status is with the districts and where the input from Patriot is. Um, that's really part of the issue: is Patriot getting into the system and doing data inputs so that we can finalize the numbers to present. Um, and each, don't forget that each district has to vote, at, I think usually the same day to set their tax rate so that it all gets done all at once and we can upload the data right. through gateway system at DLS or right. DOR. Yep. Um, so can are you anticipating that our next uh, select board meeting will be able to do that? So I'm not can... anticipating that. I'm anticipating okay. it'll be the end of November. The okay. the good news, like Trevor said, is Heather over at the Water District is working very hard. And the other, I have to, can't just say it, Heather, but the other um, Old Deerfields District are also working to get the sewer bill readings ready, or the sewer readings, water readings ready for us to use for the sewer bill, sorry. Okay. That That's an influx of cash that's that does allow us to continue to not worry so much. All right. Do you want me to give an update on the pipe? Yes. Can you? So I spoke with um, Jeff Galley this week, 
and uh, he had called and just was wanted to understand the timeline because he had, you know, you, you would talk to the trustees and, you know, that we couldn't go out to bid on the project till we had the money. What, what we can do, and I talked with DPC, um, what we can do over the winter is do the permitting so that we have time, you know, ahead of time to do the engineering and the permitting. And, and then um, Jeff said he won't have money in his budget till like mid January. So as soon as, and that, that's fine. So we can go ahead with the engineering of the project and then by mid January, um, they'll be funded and then they can fund us and then we can go out to bid and it'll be a summer project again when the kids are gone and there's a low, lower flow. So this um, this this contract is for the uh, engineering work and the permitting that needs to happen. So we could move forward on that, or you could wait a week and move forward on it, however you want to do. But um, so so the to... contract is for seventy nine thousand yes five hundred and sixteen dollars and seventy six cents correct, and that was in the, the budget rates. that we voted yes. for the rates. Yes. Okay, so we're covered on that. We have the money for that. Well, then let's move we ahead can on move this. forward and then do the permitting All over right. the winter. And then once we get to, um, you know, once they're funded, they'll send us the money and then we can work with them on timing as to when we want to do the work. Okay, so why don't we do that? Um, there is a question, however, on contracts. Yes. So, so I still have concerns about, and it's no knock to DPC. Um, I had a conversation with council. Council's pretty concerned about us not using our own contracts. So... It appears that this sort of came to a head very quickly. Um, I discussed this contract with council in particular, and there's still some terms I'd like to iron out with DPC. So I'll have a separate conversation with Dave Prickett and Justin. But if you want to get started on this right away. We can get started right away if you want to talk. About I would it, like to, can... to start with a new contract I... document that's our template. That because term. I went through the terms, they have an addendum in that contract that captures some information from our contracts, but not all of it. Well, they so the background was is that you know what every time we do a contract with them, it wasn't our contract; it was their contract. So, what Dave's team and their lawyers had done was to was to put an addendum on their contract that was everything that Lisa wanted, but things may have changed periodically. They have been done so. Can we, we vote? Just, can we vote this contract now? Of, uh, anticipate subject that you're to changes by the contract. Yeah, because yeah, I don't think there's. I mean, they're fine doing. He just didn't want to spend a bunch more money on lawyers to redo contracts again. You just like whatever you need, fine. So yeah. just yeah, there were a couple of items that I talked to council about. So how about um, you authorize me to sign this contract when it's sorted out? Yep, I'll make a motion to approve the contract for the pipe. Uh, repair stuff in, in Old Deerfield? Subject to legal Subject adjustments. Subject to legal necessary. adjustments. And you'll just let me know when that and, gets and, and authorized. And authorize the chair to sign yes, at her convenience. Sign. Yes. And okay. that's, that's for engineering? For the yeah. engineering. And for engineering of the replaced pipe replacement. And, and yes. Is it also yes. construction oversight? Yeah. Yeah, everything. that's what I thought. Yep. Yep. You'll do I'll that. second it. Um, is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Tim Hilchi, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Um, I just want to say that the reason why I want to do this is because we don't want to skip through another summer. No. I mean, no, we really wanna, need to be prepared they want, to do this. Right. The they summer. want to do the work. I mean, the reason why they're paying for it is because yeah. they yeah. want to do yeah. the work in the summer when the kids aren't there. Right. So, no, we're grateful, very grateful yeah. for the help. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. All right. And um, uh, I was just curious, Trevor, if you, yep. you could, um, comment on the water pipe that they want to put yes. in. So, so we um we thought of we decided to hold off on that the last great hearing. Um the pipe talking with Eric and stuff, the pipe that goes to the plant is a little undersized. It works fine, but what Dave thought is like when we go and redo the plant, that'd be the time to work in the the water pipe to it. Um because you know what I think what um what Eric would like would be a hydrant down by the plant and and so you'd need a bigger pipe. I think it's a four inch pipe now. I wanted to go larger. Mm -hmm. and, I, I um, think we're replacing it to a six inch. Yeah, something, something like, like that. six yeah. inch. But he just felt like the cost was unsure of at the moment and it really didn't affect anything right now. And he thought, why don't we do that when we do the plant project? Right. It makes makes yeah. Perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. Roll it in at that point. So yeah. 
Well, that's when the ground's going to be dug up anyway. Exactly. So why so it why, why do, do it? Then. Why do it twice? Yep. Okay, that makes sense. Um, did you have the Tilton Library contract yet? I do not, and I wanted to just let the board know. So P3, um, the OPM, and the architect are conferring on some details. Um, council, council may want to go over this with you all. And so I was wondering if you want to potentially schedule to have that discussion topic on the next meeting. I don't know if when I talked to Ben about it before, um, the contracts lawyer in Lisa's office, um, he suggested that because these are very, these are very nuanced documents. Um, but we were, we were waiting, Ben and I were waiting to see whether the architect was going to architect was going to come back with a lot of changes. I haven't seen those changes. So I, when I reached out to the OPM, I asked, and so just potentially, do you want me to have Chris put this on as a, another, keep this on the next agenda? Yeah. Um, what we might have to do if that was the case is rearrange when that discussion happens so that we could get counsel in and out. So we don't use up a lot of valuable um, mon monetary resources with council. So, um, it's the 15th. If we do put it on the 15th, is that going to mess up any of the timeline for the library? I don't think really it, we need to get it. I, I'm surprised that we haven't gotten yeah. a response because we need to be able to send them their paychecks. We've got four bills that we were payments for four bills that we're sitting on. What contract? Who are we waiting on the contract? For? Johnson Roberts. And that's the, for the library. Yeah. That's the architect. I know they're doing work. Why are it's they, just I don't. Why don't? We, how are they doing work if we don't have a contract yet? They've been doing the work out of the goodness of their hearts. I but give Phil a lot of credit. Hold up in the contract. I don't know its language, Trevor. I don't know what their comments are, yeah. but our comments. So first of all, we had to do the research on this whole thing because normally you wouldn't continue a contract that's over five years old, but this is a special circumstance because this whole renovation project is subject to that grant. And so that grant turnover was eight years running to get yeah. approval. Yeah. So when I talked to the OPM about it, he said, yeah, I understand where council's coming from, but this is a special circumstance. So what they did, the OPM gave me the information. I talked to council about it. We sent it off to the architect. I haven't heard back. And nobody wants to hold this up. I'll be honest with you. It's just, we need to hear back from Johnson Roberts if they have an issue. And so that's what I was waiting for. All and right. I reached out to the OPM and he said he was going to talk to them today, but I never had a chance to talk to him. All right. Well, let us know. What the, oh, so, so, Tim, I just want to, I just want to ask, go back two things on this discussion, decision items. Um, this mentions estimated fiscal year 2025 tax bills. I, mean, I meant 24. No, it is 20. Yes. It should Are be we, 24. Yeah. It should oh, be 24. 24. Yeah. That's a typo. Sorry. Yeah. No, I just was thinking, sheesh, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I, I missed a year here. <laughs> no, okay, no, good. that was our typo. Sorry. All right. All right. I, well, I knew what case. I keep looking over it. I look at it and it know, just doesn't sorry. twig in my head because I'm thinking 24. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. All right. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing some new ones. Here, I thought we were just being super proactive. <laughs> That's right. it, being super proactive. Yes, yes, thank you. Right. We're supposed to be doing oh, estimated it. tax bills for the next year. Yeah, we got to make sure whatever we have to do, we have to yeah. get going on that too. And and we'll work on the idea that we could do temper. We could do Sem yeah, a, a yeah, preliminary yeah, tax bills yeah. for sem because it's odd because we're a semi annual community. But I think there's a way to do that. I just don't know what the details. Are. I, I, if yeah. Ernestin can do it, I know we can do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we need to do a particular thing. So that's the investigative piece. Okay. I know, but we should be able to do it. I, my mom gets estimated tax bills. Okay. Um, so uh, letters of support, Casey, thank you for putting my um, testimony on let, letterhead to get that out. I don't have any other, anybody else have any letters of support they want done? Nope. Okay. Um, moving on. Do we have the building inspector? So I don't have, I have a name, but I don't have confirmation that he's willing, that he's at a point where he could, okay. uh, that Bob can give us his uh, okay. information. So just put it on for next. Yeah. Um, cannabis equity policy. I haven't, truthfully, I haven't read it yet, Casey. Yeah, so okay. So if you guys want to take another week, another yep. two weeks to read it, yep, uh, it does give us time to put it on letterhead and make it official. Um, 
Chris, could you keep this on the agenda for the next the next meeting, please? I'm sorry. Got, I just really I haven't could, read it. Yeah, neither. I, I really didn't have time. It, so. It's it's a lot to take in. Oh. I have to say, because there's a memo oh. that outlines this is there any, and why we need is it. Is there any ne negative feedback you've heard on anything on this? That's a loaded question. I have not asked my STAM colleagues about Can you just this. find out if there's I any... I think it's just, it's part of the regulation, so we have to comply. I know, but is there any downside that you're hearing? If you could just put that out, I'd appreciate it. Okay. I, I just want to make sure that we're at least on top of that. Uh, I, so when you read those things, you can't think of all the scenarios. Um, so it's interesting that, you know, <laughs> we, we don't qualify as a social equity community, but we are bound <laughs> by social equity. Exactly. Um, so maybe this will, maybe cannabis will help us become a social equity community. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't either. It's mm. just the state is constantly trying to put us into you know, peg us and, you know, hammer us down into their little, their square hole, whatever. And it just is so irritating sometimes. Okay. Casey, do you want to give us some updates, you and Chris? Why don't I have Chris start? Sure. So how's everybody doing this week? I haven't seen much of anybody. Yeah, doing good. Yeah. Good. So um, I've been at procurement training uh, yesterday and today and oh, also nice. tomorrow um, as part of the OIG's office one free designee program. Thank you again to Casey for encouraging me to yeah. move forward with that and huge cool. thank you to the OIG's office for putting that on this year. Yes. I think a lot yeah. of communities, especially us smaller towns, have found it really helpful to be able to get that educational resource that's normally pretty expensive. Um, given for free so it's it's fantastic um learning a lot and looking forward to continuing uh in terms of the leary lot so i had a brief meeting today i talked with uh david pomerantz from rivermore energy as well as jeff squire uh and a couple of people from universal electric um, we talked about both the town hall ev charging project and the leary lot the town hall is pretty much ready to go. Um, the only missing piece on that one is Eversource. We're, we're waiting on Eversource. It's on their list. We just don't know where it is on their list, but we're, we're optimistic that that'll happen this fall. Um, I would say before the snow flies, but um, Leary Lot. So that is also coming along nicely. Um, the site plan meeting is on Monday with the planning board. Uh, Jeff feels positive and optimistic about the presentation that he's going to give them. Um, we talked a little bit about signage and how that's going to be a factor. They have some basic signage we might need to consider um, if we if we need to look into procuring other forms of signage for directing people around if we're looking into making this a little bit more touristy, but that's going to be a little further down the road. Um, once again, Eversource is kind of what we're waiting on for this project. Um, they have expressed that they'd like to see um, the survey that Berkshire Design already conducted uh, be marked by stakes, which Jeff said can happen by next week. Um, and when that happens, then they'll be able to start planning where exactly they're going to start installing the underground infrastructure for the EV charging stations. Um, we're optimistic that that'll happen this fall as well, um, and then we would be in a really good sh in a really good spot for uh, come March to start laying pavement down and finishing up that up to get it ready for next summer. Um, I know that's not initially what anybody had wanted to hear. We had hoped to get it done this year, but I, for one, think that we did a good job at getting a lot of public input. Um, I think we we rallied a lot of support for this project and made it a really nice balance between. Um, expanding the parking capacity of downtown South Deerfield, um, adding some green space, and overall just creating a really downtown inviting uh, atmosphere for people to kind of have as their gateway to explore the area. So um, that's coming along really nicely. And thank you all for your support and patience with that project. Um, Did you hear if we got that $770,000 grant? I am still waiting on that one, unfortunately. Okay. So. Um, yeah, you'll you'll be some of the first to know once I get any notification on that, but I, ho I hope that's coming soon. Okay. Sorry, they, they just said it was going to be this fall and 
here it is November. So, yeah, I was hoping to have some word by now, but I obsessively check the uh, grants.gov uh, page where I applied, where we'll eventually find our decision. Um, and unfortunately, there's nothing yet, but um, myself and our consultants at Rivermore feel optimistic that we're in a very positive place to hopefully receive funding for this. Okay. And Chris, I, I'm not pushing on this, but I'm just curious. Uh, any update on setting the pricing on um, the chargers that we already have in town in terms of? Sure. So I was able to find um, through some old email history long before my time here, um, a contact that my predecessor had used over at ChargePoint. Um, so I haven't had a chance to schedule a meeting with them yet, but I, I'd love to talk with ChargePoint and just kind of figure out with them, how do we adjust this rate? Because what's what we have right now is garnering a lot of complaints. Understandably, it's one of the higher ones in the area. And would love to bring that down, especially given the fact that we were able to get Eversource to drop our demand charge. Right, and I would all, I would really like us to be able to to establish if is, is there a monthly charge that the town pays, regardless of how it pays for it. Is there a monthly charge, and is it static? Um, and and do we build that into whatever rate base we have? I mean, as a town, if if we're paying nine nine and a half cents for electricity and we're charging 75 on the you know there's got to be something in between and and i know well, it's complicated that, uh, yeah that sounds like such gouging and that would defeat the whole purpose of it but you know it, it's not sufficient to know that the solar offsets are paying for it i i need to know what is the number you know what is the monthly nut and and then then, the, then, say, and then when people with, ask the question, yeah. we, we don't give them an answer that sounds wishy-washy. Well, right. we're not really being charged for it because we have this money that's coming in. Yeah, well, we are being charged for it. And if we weren't paying for this, um, then we would we would be able to spend this money that we're getting from the solar array some, way, some other way. So I case. do have a couple of answers because oh, we good. went through this when we first started, but you can clarify with them, Chris. Um, so when we first started this, the thing that surprised us was there was not a lot of research about the billing piece that had happened. Right. Um, we pay for the energy that's used. Right. That in, that and there's a calculate a, a calculated formula or a formula that we used to determine what we could what it would cost us to break even. We are not breaking even. Right. Northfield isn't breaking even. I don't even know if Turner if Montague's make, breaking even at this point. Right. Um, but at, so. To Chris's credit in, in pursuing conversations about the demand fee, that will alleviate some of the stress, right. but we're still having to pay for the power. And if there is a heavy draw at any given time during the month, that's the baseline that we get charged at. Clarify what that description is. I can't remember all the, the terminology, Chris, but I know that's part of it. Um, and Kevin and I had talked about this for a while. So we don't have a specific account that we pay this out of. Um, and in fact, I said something to Brenda, I don't remember if I mentioned it to Kevin, but I said it to Brenda, in this upcoming budget season, we need to make some decisions since we are planning on installing new chargers. We need right. to make some decisions about either creating a revolving fund or creating a line item. So right now this. that money goes into the general fund, right? Right now the money goes into the general fund and okay. we pay for the electricity in other ways. So that was one of the factors that went into the cost for the electricity. Right. It isn't just about the nine cents because right. that's not what we're paying. Right. So in other words, the nine elements, cents is nonsense. Th yeah. Okay. I so there's other elements in that calculation, Tim. Yeah. Um, it would be great if they could send us some more information about that because statistics will probably have changed since this was first discussed, Chris. Mm -hmm. So if they, because I remember going through this conversation, it it will take, I will say this, it will take a vote of the select board to change the rate, the right. rate charge. So once he has some information, you guys could take that vote. Well, and then we just yeah. go into the charge point system. We have a login. We go into the charge point system and change the rate. Right. Yeah. And I'm just saying, you know, it should be a simple, a relatively simple, you know, could be, you know, calculus, you know, if X is, if X is nine o'clock AM, then Y applies. And if it's 12 o'clock, something else applies. There's got to be some formula that says, here's the baseline fixed fee. And then this is how the price of energy fluctuates. 
And this is the total cost under these conditions. If you know we're going to do you know two megawatts of power a month or whatever, I don't. I'm just making stuff up. We should be able to figure this out on a regular basis without. Well, you don't necessarily discuss. see the bills. The bills are paid right. through the um, DPW, right? And right. so there is an electric bill that comes in, right? Um, right. And, and I'm just so saying that in order to continue being able to price and make decisions about pricing, we need to understand the whole parameters of because over time, if they get if more use means that we can reduce the price, we have to understand and be able to be nimble about this. We can't have a three month conversation about pricing. And so I would say one thing to that, um, understand that no matter where you set that price, if you don't break even, you just have to be able to explain why. Yeah, exactly. And it, with more chargers, maybe that's going to change the whole formulaic structure. And with more cars using it. And yep. Yeah. Yep. I, yeah, I understand. I'm just saying that. I just want a separate account because there should, should be no money coming out that is not also offset by money coming in. And so- if we're going to have, we need to set up an account. I understand you have to seed it, but then the money not should not go into the general account. It should go. So into it that could be, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other, whether you use a revolving account or not. It's a really, I think that's going to be a deeper dive with Brenda and I to figure out what we think would be useful. Wow. Uh, yeah. But we are, we do get, because I see the emails come through. We do get funds that come into our accounts. Right. And I'm starting to see more of it. Yeah. Uh, and I understand, but I we want to track that. I mean, we oh, yeah, Brenda can track it. Yeah. It's just a question of asking for that particular okay. report. Yeah. All right. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, if there's a way to automate it so that Brenda doesn't have to track it, she just presses a button and it gives her, you know, okay, this is the story yeah. today. I if mean, we have a specific account for this, and maybe we just do it in a line item, and yeah. within a line item with a cost code, and I'll have to ask her because I don't see that bill every day, so I don't know exactly right. how that is. So forgive my ignorance. No, I'm 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 more ignorant on this than anyone. I just uh, I just want to be able to explain to people, you know. Well, we want to explain to people we're not losing money, and we're not going. Well, but we have to accept that we might for a while. Yeah. And we, we may, you know, there might be a two cent subsidy, you know, who knows? I mean, uh, at some point it has to make economic sense to everybody. Um, and so. It, if I may, I think um, the economic development incentive to have these chargers right in our immediate downtown area is definitely a selling point for them. Yeah. Um, and even if we have to pay and do end up ultimately losing a small amount of money for the electricity to run them, um, I, I think ultimately that's fine as long as that's something that the board is willing to live with as an economic development incentive. Um, and I, th I think that's definitely something um, to consider. Um, they're not necessarily intended to be a revenue maker, but it does help if they can come closer to breaking even, definitely. So, yeah, um, yeah I, think, I think that's how we approach it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry, I wasted a fair amount of time on this, but I just... You know, like to get to that point where well, we, can we want make to clarify a change. it for people. Yeah, not not a waste at all. I think it's important to get these discussions underway because we want to make sure that we're maximizing what we can do with them. So, right. thank you, Tim, and thank you, Casey, for adding those. We'll talk about the login too, Chris, because yeah, I have the login. It's written down. I just have to go find it. Sure. Okay. Um, the vulnerable uh, municipal vulnerability um, preparedness stuff. Do you want to talk about, Chris? Sure. Um, so I don't have much in the way of specific updates for this. I have been coordinating a decent amount with uh, Wayne Fiden and Chris Curtis on uh, both the MVP Action Grant Administration, as well as the MVP 2.0, some of the preliminary groundwork that's happening in that field. Um, in terms of tonight, I know that what we have arrived at as our best course forward um, is to begin thinking about appointing some members to the core team. And um, I included in the board's packet this week, um, the uh, it's called the Resilience Roadmap for the MVP 2.0 program. Uh, yeah, Wayne sure. and Chris were able to work on that and do a really great job with it, I think. And yep. uh, mm -hmm. they name a number of specific um, liaisons that we want included on the core team for the purpose of the MVP 2.0 grant. 
Uh, the two that were recommended by Wayne and Chris for appointment this evening uh, were Peter Law from the Conservation Commission to serve as that representative and Denise Mason from the Planning Board. Um, so if the board is comfortable appointing those two individuals, um, and they would I'd be- i make a motion to appoint Pete Law from the Conservation Commission and Denise Mason from the Planning Board to serve on the, the MVP core group. I'll second that motion. Um, all those in favor? Tim Hill, GI. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn, that's aye. And thank you, Denise and Pete, uh, yeah, for work. working with us. And uh, actually, I, I feel really happy that Pete is involved because one of the things we did want to do was start our hazardous mitigation renewal process. So if Pete's involved in the MVP process, then he can do some of the be included on the hazardous mitigation without having to have additional meetings. So that's really good. All right. Is there anything else you wanted to update us on, Casey? There's a couple of things. Some of my updates came throughout the meeting, but to circle back around to a question that Tim asked earlier. So Structures North had, if you look at their contract, they've really got three significant pieces that they would do for the town to develop a design for the relish rep repairs in the sanctuary. Right. And one of it was investigation of the area, analysis and design specification for the repairs and construction administration. That total cost is 29,500. And each one of those pieces, so the investigation was 3,700, the analysis and design specs are 16,900, and the construction administration is 8,900. So I just wanted to, Tim had referenced it. He, he sent me an email back. We were talking individually and I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention. Um, so that's, it's 29,500 total? Yeah. Okay. 29,500 total. And, we and that set would come that out aside. of the, the funds that were allocated uh, previously. Uh, previously. Yep. So when can they get started on that? They're already started. Perfect. They're already started. And the other thing that Tim had asked me was the um, deadline, which is December 15th. Now, if we need to change that, we can, but it gets us to a point where we could start considering the, the RFP process towards the middle or end of December. So well, this was one thing that I wanted to clarify in my own mind. Um, the administration piece seems to, you can't administer something unless it's been put out to bid. Right. And so is the RFP part of this? Yes. So what yeah. happens is, is you need the design specifications to start an RFP. Right. Once the RFP comes back, they help us determine the bidder that fits the criteria and then the bidder the the vendor that does that construction work they over help us oversee right so what i'm trying to understand is when does the rfp get written i mean obviously you got to design something before you can put out an rfp but are we writing the rfp i don't think so we would get some help from them right um it, it, they may not they may not do it exactly the way dpc does it dpc does the majority of that work but I think we can either use, use other people's work to help us with it or work with them directly. But there's timelines. So understand, Tim, there's timelines for building construction sure, work sure. that are pretty Oh yeah. Yeah. No, but pretty I'm pretty tight. Yeah. And I so just, you have to have certain things on certain days to make certain deadlines. Right. And so if the, if the December 15th applies to what part of this? Does it apply so to December the investigation? So we expect the design. Uh, the draft design specifications. Right. And then we're going to have back and forth with them. Yeah. And at, at, what, at some point we'll say, well, look, you know, how how you, you've you designed this, you must know what a construction company needs to bid on. Uh, right. So the design specifications are actually how the construction company bids, because what it does is it outlines the needs that they say need to have, the, the needs of the, it's right. really the scope. Right. Yeah. Um, and then there's metrics to evaluate that scope. Right. And we have to go through this process of notifying, putting it in the central register, right. getting the bids back, reviewing the bids, and then putting an apparent low bidder or an apparent right. low bid list together. Yeah. Then we confer with them and check references. And, okay. um, so I, yeah, I guess I'm just trying to figure out, are we going to need money to write an RFP? Because we can't go out to bid until we have an RFP and it goes through that process. Right. So, I need to see what they come back with right. respects. Um, we may not need to, or if we do, we may be able to do it at a reduced cost. I okay. think it depends on what we come back with respects. Okay. 
Good, because I I do want us to see move ahead on it. Because I told did I CCU BCCU on any of this? I I don't know if I did. Um, I went up there with another engineer, um, and now that I know that Structures North is yeah. signed and we've signed, um, I'm going to tell them you know we don't need you because you know somebody else is the board's already made a decision about this. Um, but I did look at the degree of deflection in the in the areas that are under stress and and it's definitely progressing so right. We've got um, going. you know I like know. support support snow, beams like here snow load. are dropped down here yeah you know and and the actual member on the exterior of the building where the wall reads meets the yeah. roof is pushing out more yeah we've got and, it and uh yeah so just okay. want to save it before it falls yep um, can, I really want to make sure that we're doing this as fast as possible. Case. We're yeah. doing it as, based on a timeline yeah. that we, that Structures North actually yeah. filled in. The, right. the December fifteenth sounds great to me. You know, I mean, it's not it's not tomorrow, but it's very close. Yeah, it, it's a reasonable time since they've already done the first evaluation. Yeah, I just want I, to make sure we try to do something before the snow load, like Tim said. Well, we won't be able to do any work work until we go through the bid process, I know. but it gets us but, into getting closer to being able to strike that up. I know. I just get worried about this stuff. Um, is there anything else? Yeah, there's a couple of things. So the Old Deerfield Wastewater Treatment Plant peer review, I've been conversing via email and on the phone with the uh, peer, the engineering group that's doing this within Weston and Samson Engineers. And they had a couple of questions. And so I started looking through some of my documentation and I've sent them as much as I have but their questions sort of came back. And one of the things that hit me was I couldn't answer something. I had an idea of what the board had discussed in terms of design plans. So there wasn't, I, I just wanna settle what I remember. Um, so part of the reason that there, there hasn't been a decision on a particular design plan to use is one, the questions, the back and forth with the nonprofits because the nonprofits have a stake in this. And you've generously had conversations with them. And they provided us with information, um, which initiated this peer review. Um, so they had a design plan. We had several options for a design plan. My recollection is we didn't settle on one. We Each didn't. one has their own elements of importance in, in terms of what DPC has provided. Right. DPC provided one option at the end that we wanted them to review, which was the final thing that you had sent me a it was the 10 it was the 1022 the... one right. or the 1122 yep. one we got it in october yep. last year that's it so i sent that along good and um, the issue is that when they evaluate they can't be evaluating the the nonprofit plan because it, it, it they need to evaluate the nonprofit plan but it needs to be evaluated as if it's 250 gallons and and so, so that's like that's the other thing we need to maintain the flow that the, yes. the NIPTES permit is Absolutely. is no no reduction in the permit right so two hundred fifty thousand maintain every day. the capacity choose yep. a, a basically a design and this is something I was trying to figure out I don't know the exact terminology um, a design that has a a life cycle and associated cost for a time span of at least forty years right. Right. I don't exa if know we, exactly if how we, to see that. Right. If we decide that the cheapest way to do this is go through USDA, that's a 40-year rent loan. So we don't want a 20-year plan that we have to replace when we have a 40-year loan. Okay. Yeah, and that's why um, when I responded to you, I, I suggested that it might be useful before they do too much work to have a phone or a Zoom conversation for 15 minutes and talk through what the scope of work was. Yes. Exactly. And um, because Absolutely. they've assigned this to somebody else that's not Wester. And um, so my personal feeling is that's the best way to go because then you can look somebody in the eye in a Zoom meeting and say, do you understand what I'm saying? Right. Am I making sense? If we go back and forth through emails, it just takes a whole day off somebody's ability to work on anything else. Yeah. Um, so, and, and if they can have a conversation with the operator of the plant, yeah, chief operator of the plant, tremendously helpful because he will explain what he does, what his costs are. I know I talked well, to so, Yeah, about so the costs them. are actually something that you have to physically go through two years of bills to yes. find because those plants are not 
all the bills are paid at once. There's not two different Correct. cost codes for each plan. And right. Eric is ready to take that over. He wants to do the bills. He wants to separate yeah, them. We talked he's going to take all that. So he knows he's talking to you. But the other that. thing about this is in an analysis of, a high, you know, the, this is basically a hypothetical right. exercise at this point. Exactly. A plant that does not exist, a standard pl operating plant and an MDR based plant. Yep. DPC says that they will provide um, an o, o and M calculation. They're going to, they're yeah. Dave Prickett says he's already working on yep. it and he will um, turn it over to you and, or Weston and Samson, probably best yeah. if it goes through you. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, but I just, just nice so that, so that uh, we don't end up in a situation where, well, you let DPC talk to them, but you're not right. letting us talk no, to no, them. Exactly. You yeah. Know, and, should be. and um, so antiseptic. Yeah, and and it's re as far as I'm concerned, OPM on a hypothetical plant has to be hypothetical, right? You know, because MBR uses a lot more electricity, it uses a lot more, you know, um, man hours, et cetera. So uh, if, if it's cheaper at the end of the forty year period, you have to be able to compare right in the short term and then the long term, what is the overall cost of the project and so I think DPC not understands that they need to. They didn't provide that in the in the in the November tenth, twenty twenty two. Twenty twenty two, yeah. Um, but I, I shared that back with Casey just so it's all in one email. Great, thank um, you. Thank you. Yeah, it, it is a little okay because I just wanted to sort of distill what I thought I remembered. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree with Tim. Just a quick conversation yeah. so that everybody is clear on yeah. this on the scope. And I'm I'm happy to do that. Or yes, Trevor has got more knowledge about no, the sewer. Go ahead. Um, go ahead. You know what we're looking uh, Tim, yeah. you know you know what, what um our uh what our criteria. Are. I would tie in Eric. That oh yeah, yeah. Yes. I think that yes. I think that the that the you know, peer reviewer should. Yes. He 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 works for the town, and they should be able to consult him. Exactly. Right. But exactly. I think it would be helpful to have him on the in same the meeting. Oh yeah, yeah. With you right. so that we know that all our bases are covered. And yeah. all discussions. Yeah. I think they, here in the, they the agree that it's better to have a conversation. Yeah, than I do too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Because all right, so it. that's that's an update on that yeah. particular yeah. project. Wonderful. Thanks. Uh, okay. I sent you an email. We received a complaint about barking of a dog. Take a look at it. I've also forwarded it to council since it relates to a current. Can you order. just respond that? Um, I mean, it's it's out of our I hands. I want to talk to council appeal. before I respond. I just it's, want you. It to is know. appealed. Uh, I mean, just saying it's appeal being appealed. Well, this is a different complaint, so I want to talk to counsel. Well, uh, but I wanted you to be aware of it. I, he has sent in several letters, and um, you know, we didn't. It's, when did that email come? It went out today. I sent it to the, you earlier. Um, the barking is a nuisance complaint. We have right. already designated the dog as a dangerous dog. Because they're two different things. Barking it's, is different from bites. That's right. So I just wanted you to be aware that I have sent it to counsel. And I and I've had tried to explain that um, that we designated it as a dangerous dog, which is different from the nuisance dog, which is the barking. Can a dog be both a nuisance and dangerous? It's, it has to have another hearing. Yeah. 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 Okay. And I choose not to have another hearing if right. if until this one's if, done. Yeah. Until this one's done, and uh, I, and I also choose not to have our lawyer. Be, I mean, it, it, in having a lawyer come to every single thing is expensive. So well, I, it, I, because this relates to a complaint that's already out there, I feel I think we need to make sure that we're not overstepping yeah. or not not responding. Uh, I so. I wanted to bring everybody up to date on the SCEMS chief's position. We concluded the last interview and I sent you a recommendation via email. Um, there's two can can candidates um, that the group recommends for final as finalists for interviews. Um, I did make a suggestion in that memorandum that both boards meet concurrently and be able to interact with the finalists um, during those interviews and then be able to converse about it later. Um, so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. If you haven't seen it in your email, take a look. No, I saw it. It's great. Um, so we're moving ahead with that. We Chris has been out, so there's a couple of things 
there's a bunch of stuff that's come up while he was out. Um, but we've got interviews we have to set up for the town clerk position. Um, and then other things we're going to have to do in the midst of that. We also have to, one of the things that's on the radar screen is we have to make adjustments in the office space to welcome Christopher Dunn, um, who is the planning economic development coordinator um, that's been hired by the town. So that needs to be addressed before the beginning of uh, the beginning of December. Um, and Chris and I will be circling back around on that. Tim um, has a comment. Can I ask a couple of questions sure. about that? Yeah. Um, so um, in the last couple of weeks, I've been had occasion to work with Cindy Maeski on several occasions, clearing out the old church. And um, I wondered how soon is FCAT or is there a plan for FCAT to vacate the space it's in? So Jonathan and I have talked about that. And they really need to be able to get equipment in their space in Sunderland to handle it remotely. There's a two-factor piece here. There's the procurement pieces of it, which are, which initially we didn't follow, but we weren't sure we needed to follow a specific procurement process because FCAT is a little bit different than the town. Um, and then there's the piece of, do we have the resources for them to be able to do this work? Um, and even if FCAP moves out, that's not optimal space because we have no place to put our servers except that. that room. Right. I'm, I'm just wondering, there's there's two rooms right next to each other. There are. Right? And but the the. Just the question. heating and cooling of that is one unit. So Same. if we were to move the servers into the smaller space in that office, we might have to make changes to how that how that space is cooled. Um, and that's that adds an element of expense. So I don't want people to rely on that office quite yet because we're not there. Yeah, no, what I, I just was going to say is that um, let's have a discussion before you and Chris decide something about like one idea I had is if Cindy's not in this office, could Chris and Christopher occupy that space and um, and you and Pat Kroll occupy the space that you currently occupy with Chris? Does that make sense? I mean, we, we need to discuss all the various options and, and then what do we do with the room that Pat's in currently? Um, is that big enough for Cindy says, I really don't need an office this big. Well, the problem is, is she's got a lot of stuff. Yeah. She has to have privacy for clients. Initially years and years ago, this must've been over 10 years ago. The public health nurse was in the office space, the pets in, but you needed privacy and you needed space to have other elements. You've got a refrigerator for any kind of vaccine that has to be maintained. We have to have a sharps area. We have to be able to have a desk space and stuff. So you also need to have a separation if a nurse has clients for basically a waiting space. That's the reason those two offices were used. Right. Um, could you make those changes? Sure. But where if if she does have clients, how are we going to manage that? Right. Um, so just keep that in mind. As, as a conversation, and I won't paraphrase what, but she basically says most of her work is that the senior can be done in the senior is, center setting right. and that a lot of the work that she does here is basically socialization with people who come in and talk for 45 minutes mm -hmm. so if we could do something with that storage of stuff out back maybe we, we talked about one time blowing a hole through the back of pat's office and, and blowing because that the other storage room is behind it it's not heated or air conditioned uh, mm, yeah, yeah i guess if you had an open door it would be heated and air conditioned. I don't know how big it it's is. It's not heated now. Pat's space is not heated. I know yeah. it's not. It's cold. Yeah. All right. Well, so I'm I'm, I hear what you're Let's saying. We're exactly trying to be creative, important. but we're limited. Yeah. Because yeah. even if we blow that out, what are we going to do with the materials? Even if some of it gets disposed of, right. there's still storage that's used back there. Yep. Can we take the uh, conference room in the meantime? Hmm? Can we take over the conference room in the meantime or no? I know we use it. We still have committees that use that space. Not everybody is remote. All I'll say about this is that we're bringing in a full time employee who needs an office full time, yeah. and we're going to have to consider bouncing a part time employee right. 
out of what space we need to, in order to do the or the we reorganize how we're currently using the office space right there. Uh, Cindy's yeah. fine with yeah. if we end up with Pat's space, I think. Um remember right. well, the fur cog was I'm using what yeah, the exactly. fur cog. I, was, I know. Sorry, but the, sorry Casey. <laughs> but the fur. <laughs> but the fur cog was using that space for their entire nurse public health nurse program, yeah. and there was multiple nurses in there. Yeah. That's not the case now. Yeah. So, and we want Cindy with the senior center. Yeah. So, we'll um, we'll I I yeah. think she could use a much smaller space. But I appreciate the problem you're facing, Casey. Yeah. So I know it ain't easy. It ain't easy to work in a space that just we've outgrown. Yes. So that's pretty much the gist of my report. Is there anything you think I forgot, Chris? I don't think so. I think you covered it pretty well. Okay, then I will take a motion. The most, the most motion adjourned, adjourned, I think, is what we forgot. <laughs> Did you make that? I'll, I'll, make, it. I'll, I'll make a motion. Okay. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Chairman McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank, Thank you, you all at, very much. Uh,